Uh, Bishop, thank you uh, for sitting down with us. What's been going through your mind over the last couple of weeks? Well, certainly these have been very difficult and trying days for the church in our nation and around the world and now even, of course, internationally. Very trying, very difficult days. Um, it's, it's very hard to uh, go to bed thinking about these things every night and waking up to them once again. But it also reminded me very clearly of the um, pain, the suffering, um, the anguish that victims of sexual abuse have to deal with every day. They go to bed thinking about it. They wake up thinking about it for many, many years. One of the things we've learned about sexual abuse of minors is that it's a wound that does not heal quickly. And it can last many, many years. It can damage the body and, and soul and mind. So um, the uh, situation I'm going through and the church in general is going through right now, maybe it's, it's helpful for us to remind her that's what the victims, the survivors of sexual abuse uh, go through all the time. And we have to always keep that in the front of our minds. Three years ago, I went to Philly. <clears throat> Uh, we did extensive coverage, Washington, Philadelphia, when the Pope came, it was incredible. Then I watched the pictures <laughs> in Ireland, and it seemed to be a shell of what happened in Philadelphia. Do you see that as a ripple effect of what's been going on? I suppose, and again, I was in Ireland, so I don't know exactly what the response was or what the outcome was. Um, as you know, it's also been a very difficult time for the church in Ireland, not just in recent months, but over recent years. It's a very, very different scene than when uh, Pope John Paul visited there, what, 30 years ago, I think. Ireland has changed completely. The church in Ireland has changed completely. So I suppose there are many factors that went into the uh, uh, meeting of the world, world meeting of families this time. Uh, I suppose there are lots of factors, but it was certainly different than it was uh, when St. John Paul was there about 30 years ago. Do you think the church <clears throat> leadership has kind of lost their moral <clears throat> compass, judging what's right or wrong? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, not in general, no. I think there are um, many, many fine leaders in the church, um, a national and international level. Um, obviously, many of our bishops have made mistakes and uh, handled this abuse crisis very poorly to the detriment of the victims and the survivors and their families and the whole church. Uh, priests have offended and bishops have not done well in handling it. At the same time, there are so many wonderful priests, so many wonderful bishops who are doing a great, great work and, and dedicating their lives to Christ and the church. And, and keep in mind too that the, the teachings of the church and the ministry of the church does not depend necessarily on the effectiveness or the holiness of the individual ministers. Uh, throughout the history of the church, uh, priests have acted badly, bishops have acted badly, and sometimes popes have acted badly. We know that. It's part of the 2000 year history of the church. But the teachings of Christ go on, even when they are conveyed by very imperfect and sometimes sinful instruments. So it doesn't affect necessarily the ultimate work of the church or the ultimate teaching or, or mission of Christ. That goes on as it has for 2,000 years, even though the people who lead and, and serve the church sometimes haven't been very faithful and have not been very holy themselves. Cardinal Dolan <clears throat> said, uh, quote, I really worry about a loss of credibility loss of trust. This is disastrous. Do you feel that some people have totally lost trust and will never come back? And how do you fix that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's probably true. I think some people have lost their trust in the church, have lost their trust in church leadership, and I have no doubt that some have left and probably will never be back. This is a very difficult and confusing time for Catholics in general, not just the victims and the survivors of abuse who course, are first um, in our thoughts and our prayers. But for many other Catholics too, those on the borders and those who have been faithful Catholics for, for many, many years, it's a very difficult and confusing time. And it's understandable that some people would be uh, distanced from the church and especially the leadership of the church at this time. I guess all I would ask them to do is to reflect upon this situation very carefully, to pray about it, to think about the good priests they've known in their lives as faithful Catholics and all the things the the church has done to help them over the years um, and to reflect on those things and, and balance that with the injuries and the, and the shame and the guilt that's being, being caused now. Um, the reaction, the lack of trust, the lack of credibility, certainly very, very understandable. But we hope upon reflection and prayer, they'll remember the whole picture and uh, what the church is and what the church has done for them throughout their lives. You are auxiliary <clears throat> bishop 
Pittsburgh, 1992 to 1996. Uh, you were not called by the grand jury. <coughs> what was your job description? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's true. First of all, I was not uh, involved in the grand jury process in Pennsylvania. Um, I was not interviewed by the grand jury. Um, I was not contacted by the grand jury. And in the 800-page report, my name is not mentioned even once. Um, my job description in um, the Diocese of Pittsburgh, I was the vicar general and moderator of the Curia, um, which meant I was responsible for running the internal operations of the diocese, pretty much on behalf of the bishop on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my office was not involved in, directly involved in, or responsible for dealing with clergy issues, whether it's assignment of priests or clergy misconduct. Um, that was not part of the responsibilities that the bishop asked me to undertake. Let me emphasize, however, that even though I was not personally um, uh, charged with taking care of clergy uh, issues, whether it's assignments or misconduct, the Diocese of Pittsburgh was indeed handling these things very um, correctly and, and very responsibly, I think. The accusations um, were sent to the bishop's office or to the clergy office or to the legal office or to the communications office. The accusations were being reported to civil authorities. Priests were being removed from ministry. The parishes were being notified. There were public news releases. The victims and survivors were interviewed. They were provided with assistance. So all of that work in the diocese was taking place very responsibly, in my view, but it was not going through my office because other people were charged with and authorized with take care of those things. Of course, I was aware of the allegations after they came into the diocese. I was part of the diocese. I was a priest. I was a bishop. I became aware of them after they were reported to the diocese and they were already being handled by the bishop's office, the clergy office, the legal office, communications. They were already being reported and dealt with very responsibly. But I personally was never involved in dealing with clergy issues. Um, that's, that's been a, a confused message, I think, recently, perhaps because of my responses, but also, I think, because of some, uh, shall I say, difficult headlines. So the, <clears throat> what you're talking about here is, you said, and I'm paraphrasing, it was, uh, the report was outside the scope of my responsibility, and I think that's where the firestorm uh, is. Right. Well, again, the reports were given to the diocese, and the diocese was dealing with them. Again, through the bishop's office, the legal office, communications, the clergy office, they were being dealt with, but they weren't being dealt with um, by me personally, because I wasn't directed, I wasn't authorized to do that. It does not mean I wasn't aware of them or sensitive to them after the fact. They were terrible events for the diocese and, and for the church. But um, the vicar general and the uh, moderator of the curia doesn't handle everything that comes into the diocese. People in a chantry in any diocese are assigned to do different things finances and schools and clergy and social services. Not everybody does everything in the diocese. And even as the vicar general and auxiliary bishop, there were many things I was not directly involved in, and clergy misconduct was, was one of them. But it was being handled very responsibly by the diocese. Again, the civil authorities were notified, priests were removed, there was publicity, parishes were notified, victims were assisted. That was all taking place outside of my venue. Did you ever know of any <clears throat> priest in question not following their, their calling, so to speak? <clears throat> Did you turn them in at all? That no, and again, I wasn't aware of any of this misconduct until it was reported to the diocese. Um, that, that's, that was the way it was, um, I guess, part of the problem in the church is a lot of these things were done secretly, even among other priests you may have known or had some contact with. You didn't know what their personal behavior was. So no, I was not aware of any of these priests doing these misdeeds until someone reported it to the diocese. And then it was dealt with, I think, um, in a very open and uh, transparent and, and responsible way. That's why in 800 pages of grand jury report, my name wasn't mentioned because I was not involved in these issues. And I have to say it's somewhat ironic that if my name had been involved in the grand jury report in some way, um, that would have been a story. But the fact that my name is not involved in the grand jury report, that seems to become a, a story too. But if there had been any kind of malfeasance or irresponsibility or, or lack of discretion on my part, that surely 
would have been in the grand jury report um, and the half million to 500,000 pages of, uh, uh, that were involved in the grand jury report. So you alluded to this a second ago. You said this, it is my experience the Diocese of Pittsburgh has been very responsible and transparent in responding <coughs> to allegations of sexual abuse and has been one of the leading dioceses in the country in that regard. But over 70 years, we're talking about 1,000 kids that the grand jury um, cited. Are you, what kind of time frame are you referring to here? Because if you listen to that statement, sure. and 1,000 kids have been abused, how can they be the leading diocese? Sure. Well, as you said, again, the grand jury report covers 70 years. Some of the allegations it reported were, were reported apparently before I was even born. So there's a long scope of history here involved. I was directly involved in the administration of the diocese for 11 years, uh, as first as bishop secretary and then as the vicar general and moderator of the curia. So um, all I can speak to is the 11 years that I was involved. I have no doubt that over the 70 year history of, of reporting in the Diocese of, of Pittsburgh that there were terrible mistakes made, that things were not handled properly, that priests were moved around. Um, but again, we're dealing with things in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, I think the Diocese of Pittsburgh now, as every diocese in the country, the Diocese of Pittsburgh now and the Diocese of Providence now is very different now than it was 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. Even the grand jury report in Pennsylvania in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, something like 90% of the allegations are more than 25 years old. So the church today in Pittsburgh, the church here in Providence and across the country is very, very different now than it was throughout its history because of the response of bishops, the charter, the increased scrutiny, all which I think has served to help the church today become very different than it was throughout its history. Major Kevin O'Brien, your compliance uh, director, officer, um, longtime member of the Rhode Island State <coughs> Police, said Rhode Island is not <coughs> Pennsylvania. So what's the difference? Well, again, I guess you'd have to ask, ask Kevin ex exactly to explain it. I think what he is saying is that um, if we look at our track record here in the Diocese of Providence, especially since the charter in 2002, but even in the decade before that, really going back to the early 90s, I think the Diocese of Providence has been very um, responsive to, very transparent about, and very accountable to these um, reports of sexual abuse of minors. Um, and I think anybody who would uh, want to challenge my track record on this would look at my record here um, and in Youngstown, the 22 years that I've been a diocesan bishop, I have been very firm on these things and very consistent. When we've had allegations of, rebuse, of abuse here in, in Providence, the priest has been removed from ministry, um, his faculties have been removed, it's been reported to the civil authorities, including the attorney general and the state police, the parishes where the priest served were notified, we did public notices, we did outreach to the survivors and, and, and the victims. Um, all of this can be documented. So for the last 20 years, at least, when we've received reports of, uh, credible reports of abuse of, of minors here in Providence, we've responded very quickly and very aggressively um, to do everything we could um, to deal with, with these issues in a very responsible way. Again, was it different in, you know, in 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 years ago? Probably, but all of society was different then too, all of culture. The way we dealt with these things as a society, as a culture, were different then than they are now. The fact is right now, in this point in time, the Catholic Church is one of the safest places for children and young people to be because of our safeguards, and people should be confident of that. But that's a hard sell. After they see <clears throat> this, they watch the movie Spotlight, they don't believe that. Well, of course, it's, it's a hard sell. But again, most of these allegations and report go back before the charter, go back before the 90s, they go back into the 80s and 70s and 60s, and I think that has all been, been pretty well documented. So is it a hard sell? Of course. But I think if people look at our track, or track record now and in recent years, um, there's a more balanced view of all this. As I mentioned, there's a trust <coughs> factor at the beginning. There have been calls for you to step down and resign. Do you plan to do that? No. First of all, I have no reason at this point to step down and resign. Why would I do that? Again, I think I responded to these incidents very responsibly and, and very transparently. Um, but I serve at the discretion of the Pope. Um, if he ever wants me to resign, I'll go in a heartbeat. 
at his, at his request and in obedience to him. But anyone who has a complaint about me or a grievance against me, I encourage them to send it to the Holy Father, send it to the Pope through Washington. I will always respond to what the Pope wants me to do, as I have throughout my priesthood. Um, but I see no reason now why, uh, no, no reason now why I would be um, asked, and from a reasonable point of view, to resign or retire. Have you heard from the Vatican at all? No. So no one's reached out? No, except the, the very general statements have come to the bishops' conference, and to me, personally, no. Uh, should, the, should the ways the church prepares priests, uh, pastoral leadership, change, or are you already going through that? You know, who you're targeting, who you're looking for to become priests. And, uh, and the reason why I asked the question is Father Murphy sat down with Julianne Lima a couple months ago, and he said that we need to change the way we do things. We need to change the way we're looking at good priests. Um, your thoughts? Well, and again, that's changed a great deal um, in our seminary recruitment and the application process. We have a rather thorough application process now for uh, seminary candidates. It involves uh, recommendations from other priests. It involves interviews with uh, our review board, or the seminary admission board. It involves talking to diocesan staff who deal with vocations. It entails psychological testing and, and you know physical exams and um, all the things you would need to do to apply for a, a specialized uh, college or, or graduate program. So I'm very confident in our process for uh, recruiting priests and admitting priests. There are a number of, of guys who apply on a regular basis who are not accepted because they don't meet the criteria for one reason or another. We have a very, very thorough process of recruiting and, and um, admitting and, and training priests on all levels of seminary. So, uh, like everything else, it's not perfect. It's not foolproof. It's not guaranteed. We're dealing with human beings, but I'm very confident in our seminary process. Um, I wish we had more candidates, and I think when we talk about doing something new, we have to explore new ways of reaching out to young men who may be interested in ex exploring the priesthood, and, and I hope that they do. You had no new seminarians going <laughs> in this year. This scandal that's going on right now, it's not gonna go away. How do you get somebody to you know, get off the fence, so to speak, sure. and, and apply? Well, this scandal certainly does not help our seminary recruitment process. Um, it's, it's another uh, obstacle, another barricade, I think, for a young man to think about it. However, keep in mind that after the scandal first broke in 2002, there were still lots of seminary applications, uh, lots of young men who entered the seminary, lots of young men who were ordained. Um, so uh, I think you know, there's a certain resilience there and the other example I heard is that, um, you know, we need some young men to come forward, uh, not because of the problems in the church, but to come forward to help us, to save the church, to save the uh, institution of the church and give it renewed energy and, and vitality and credibility. I heard the example, you know, why would um, a young man think about coming into the priesthood now? Well, somebody said, why does a fireman run into a burning house to help people and to put out the fire? That's why young men would think about becoming a priest now, to come into the church, to help put out the fire, and to help save people in following the uh, vocation he has from Christ. So there have always been difficult moments, and this is a difficult moment for us without a doubt. But I think we need young men of vision and wisdom and courage who are willing to come forward, step in, run into the burning house, and help people. Practicing Catholics are saying, <laughs> open up the books. Statue of limitations. Legislators are expected to push forth uh, another bill next time extending that. Um, neighboring states, 30, 35 years. S they're saying seven is not enough. Get a grand jury, open it up. Sure. Your reaction to that? Well, in terms of the statute, um, that's a, it's a very complex legal question. More complex, I think, than it seems at, at first blush. Um, it involves the current legislation, it involves past Supreme Court rulings and the constitution of the state. I know there have been a number of discussions, especially at the end of the last um, legislative session, and more discussions taking place now in, in public calls and public debates. Um, I think the, the statute of limitations is a well-recognized legal principle, not just on this question, but for other questions as well. It's, it's a well-established legal principle and uh, we need to be very very careful about eliminating that or or changing that um, nonetheless we want to be a good neighbor we want to be part of this 
conversation that for some way that the statute of limitations a law can be changed to improve it, I think we need to explore that. And we need reasonable people, rational people to discuss this. The other thing I think would be uh, very, very important is any change in the statute of limitations law has to include not just churches, not just nonprofits, but also the public sector. A child abused in a public school is just as damaged as a child abused in church premises. So we cannot set aside the public sectors and public institutions if we're going to change the statute of limitations law. Everybody who deals with kids, who deals with children and youth, should be involved in the um, legislation about the statute too. So if everyone is involved, everyone is involved in that legislation, you would be more prone to go along with it? That would be one of the factors. It's not the only factor. It would be one of the factors because it should not be targeted to the church or just for nonprofits. We know that there is often abuse that takes place in other sectors of society too, including in our homes. And the number was, I don't know, something like 80% of the abuse of minors still takes place in domestic settings, not in schools, churches, homes, uh, scout camps, little league. It, it still largely takes place in our homes. So any statute of limitations law should include the whole broad spectrum and not just the nonprofit sector, not just churches. Uh, the Archbishop uh, <coughs> Vigano, I say his name right? Vigano, um, yes. former uh, Vatican ambassador to the United States, has alleged an 11 page letter that Pope Benedict and Pope <coughs> Francis knew the allegations <coughs> against Theodore McCarrick before uh, he resigned this summer. What did you think when you heard that? Well, it's astounding, first of all, and it's unprecedented, certainly in recent history, that someone of that um, uh, prominence, an archbishop who was a former ambassador to the United States, a former nuncio, would level those charges against the pope and against other bishops and cardinals. That's astounding, and it's unprecedented. Um, and it really does raise, raise lots of questions. Unfortunately, you know, I have no more information about that than it's been reported publicly. I've read the report, I've read about the report, there are so many discussions taking place, but it's unprecedented to um, you know, ask for the Pope to resign um, and to level these charges against him. And it's unprecedented now that we see the, the outbreak of, of basically civil war in the church. Bishops saying one thing about other bishops, cardinals saying one thing, and other cardinals saying something else. Bishops accusing cardinals of lying. I mean, it's a new and very depressing and very dangerous ground for us. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, we hope to hope and pray that lots of guys who have a lot of experience and wisdom and holiness will lead us through this crisis. And we certainly, certainly need God's guidance and grace now as much as ever. One of the allegations has been sexual misconduct against seminarians. Um, how do we go to change that culture? Well, again, I think it goes to the recruiting process that we have in our seminaries. <coughs> there have been allegations about seminarians and about priests and about bishops and now, of course, even against cardinals. So it has to be a broad-based um, response, I think, on behalf of the church, including our seminary and uh, uh, application and vetting process. Would you support a grand jury investigation opening up the books in Rhode Island? Well, um, I'm not sure exactly what that means. I understand that the law in Rhode Island is different than it is in some other states, including in, in Pennsylvania. So I don't know what that would mean exactly on what the purpose of a grand jury uh, investigation would be. We've had, um, again, certainly in recent years, a very, very good and open and transparent relationship with the Attorney General. A few years back, we signed really the unprecedented agreement with the Attorney General's office about reporting uh, allegations and it's been very, very helpful. We report everything we receive to the state police and to the attorney general's office. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose of a grand jury inve investigation would be at this point, but we always want to cooperate with civil authorities to the very, very best of our ability. And as the law allows, we have nothing to hide. We've been very transparent and that's been true for many years now. Bishop uh, Barron has said he would like to see so-called the books opened up and get lay people more involved, people who have expertise <coughs> in forensics to go through everything. Sure, I think any investigation we do does have to involve lay people. And we do have in our own diocese now the uh, Sexual Abuse Advisory Board. It's been in place since at least 2002, maybe before that, an established group of uh, mostly laymen who are very involved in the community with great credentials. Um, 
with great um, reputations who have helped us with these cases. Whenever we receive credible allegations, they go to the review board and they advise me on, on what to do. So in a sense, we've had that uh, advisory board in place for a good number of years now, and it's been extremely competent, extremely helpful. There's any new investigations from the Bishop's Conference um, or from the Vatican, should it involve lay people? Absolutely. We don't just want to investigate ourselves. That would give us no credibility at all. Phase two of your capital <coughs> campaign, I think, kicked off last weekend. You concerned about finances now? Because there are some, you can see it on social media, <coughs> there's some practicing <coughs> Catholics will still go to Mass, but their wallets are closed now. Sure. Well, again, people have to react as they feel they must react in conscience. And if that involves staying away from the church and not providing financial support, that's something they have to decide in their own conscience. We think that the church continues to do great work every day in educating kids, providing social services, reaching out to the poor, doing pro-life ministries, bringing people together for worship, uh, having our schools and, and celebrating the sacraments and weddings and funerals and baptisms. The church continues to do great work all the time. And I hope the people who, in evaluating their relationship with the church, whether it's sacramentally or financially, would remember that. Um, we have to go ahead with the work of the church. While we deal with this terrible crisis and this scandal, the work of the church has to continue to the very, very best of our ability. And we hope people will understand that and will follow us if they need and conscience to stay away from the church. I hope they think seriously about that because it's a divine obligation for them to attend Mass, for example. It's not because Bishop Tobin said so or Pope Francis said so. God said so. You have to attend Mass on Sundays and you should be receiving the sacraments. And if people want to uh, close their wallets, uh, well, um, we hope that they'll fulfill their charitable obligations somehow, somewhere, because that's an obligation that transcends me and transcends Pope Francis as well. So people have to make their judgments, but I'm confident in the work of the church, and I'm confident that people will help us in our annual appeal and in the um, capital campaign. It's helping their parishes, first of all, and we hope they've had good experience in their parishes, and it's, it's, ho it's helping the, the work of the church. All of you take a vow of celibacy. That's been brought up a lot. You should allow a priest to get married now after <coughs> seeing all this whole scandal. What do you do if you find out that some of your priests are not practicing that? Do you do anything, or is that a personal thing for them? You're talking in terms celibacy. of um, abuse of children or just in general? Just in general. Well, again, if something comes to our attention, then we um, call the priest to talk about that and find out what's going on, if it's true, if it's a one-time event, if it's an um, you know, ongoing relationship. Um, you know, we need to take that very, very seriously. If a priest gets involved in misconduct, whether it's sexual abuse or a sexual relationship with an adult, um, if it's misuse of church finances, if it's some other behavior, whenever we learn that a priest is involved in, in inappropriate behavior, we, we challenge that and, and do our best to address it. But it depends so much on each, each set of circumstances. Finally, September 14th, day of prayer uh, that you've announced in penance uh, for faults and failures as a Christian priest and bishop. You've opened it up to everybody. Is this step one before you do anything else? Yeah, well, as I said, um, you know, we, we know that our response to sexual abuse does not end on this day of prayer. But it's a highly symbolic, but I think a very important moment for the church that, that I am leading. It's a response to Pope Francis who called the whole church now to engage in prayer and penance. I will be personally involved as well to the best of my ability. We'll be at the cathedral for prayer and for Eucharistic adoration, a day of fasting as well. And, but it's not just about me, it's about our whole church. We all uh, have to undertake this pilgrimage, I think, of uh, prayer and fasting. It's what the Christian community does throughout its history. You know, going back to the Old Testament and the New Testament, the community fasts and prays to ask for God's forgiveness of its sins. It's in the Psalms. It's in the call of Jesus. It's in part of the Christian tradition. When we have sins, when we've offended God and other people, we fast and we pray. And that's what this is really in regard to. So um, it's one small step. It's certainly not the end. I don't intend for a moment to sweep everything under the rug on September 15th. This has to be an ongoing process of healing and of um, uh, dealing with the terrible crimes that, that some members of the church um, have committed. You know, the bishop's meeting is scheduled for November as well. And that's um, going to be a difficult moment. I, I guess part of me wants to say maybe we should cancel the annual bishop's meeting in November. 
Um, Why? Well, I think it promises to be um, a very divisive debacle. It's going to be uh, very controversial with the media and with so many interest groups and, and legitimate protests and so forth. I think the bishops would send a very strong signal to our people if we were to say, you know what, this is not business as usual. We're not going to go to Baltimore for four days of luncheons and statements and dinners and cocktail parties and vendors and buying things. Um, I think we would send a strong message to our people if we were to say to the bishops, stay home, stay home with your people, spend those three days in, in, in seclusion, in prayer, in penance, in charitable works, and let the, the smaller group of bishops, the executive committee, the administrative board, let them carry on the work of the conference, including dealing with whatever action plans that we need to come up with to respond to the allegations of abuse, including the uh, call for a Vatican investigation. Um, we need to go ahead with those things, the investigation. We need to go ahead with an action plan to respond um, to this crisis in the, the church at this time. But it just seems to me that this uh, um, scheduled meeting in November, we would send a very strong signal to the people if we'd say to the bishops, stay home, stay with your people, take care of them, and don't come to Baltimore as if it's business as usual with all the um, festivities and the activities that surround the, the business meeting. Um, I just don't know how productive the November meeting is going to be.